And that's around strategy. And I have a very, very special guest here. We already spoke a lot. It's highly entertaining to speak to him. Um, I'm very happy that he's here in person, coming the long way from Berlin, Moabit. Um, I actually haven't asked him, we spoke so much, we, I haven't asked him how to pronounce his name, but I think it's Jesse Lerke, a researcher at the Freie University Berlin with a PhD, but he will explain you more and he will talk with us about strategy and especially um, the countervailing move, which I have no clue what it is. So I'm very glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Let me position myself well here. All right, uh, thank you, Rise of AI. Thank you, Fabian and Veronica, for organizing this event and all the others who uh, assisted. Uh, thank you also to everybody out there who has chosen to spend their time in their quarantine with us today. Uh, my name is Jesse Paul Lerka. I am most recently a researcher at the Freie Universität Berlin. However, I've taken the little COVID break in our funding to immerse myself in the technical sides of artificial intelligence, uh, coding, learning Python, learning neural networks, which as a social scientist was something new for me. And I bring up this little anecdote because it's something I'm going to want to return to at the end of my talk today. Uh, I'll be talking to you today about AI strategy beyond the AI race, winners, losers, and especially the countervailing move, the move you make in order to offset if somebody else wins the AI race. So to structure my talk, I want to give you kind of two focal points rather than a roadmap of what, what I'm going to talk about. This will allow me some flexibility as well when I'm discussing my, uh, my points. Focal point number one is strategy. For those of you unfamiliar with strategy, strategy is the move and countervailing moves by opposing wills as they seek to get more out of a situation than the initial balance of power would suggest. Uh, this is particularly useful for the weaker party who seeks to use the paradoxical logic in order to leverage things like time and space to gain an advantage, much like the map in the background illustrates when Canada was trying to gain a strategic advantage against the United States in the 1920s to uh, conduct a preemptive invasion if necessary. Read about it if you like. It's quite interesting uh, to see how a small power thinks they can possibly win. Focal point number two is the singularity. Uh, most of you don't need a definition here of what the singularity is. I've put up my own kind of uh, collection of thoughts on it here for you. Uh, it is the exponential explosion of technology when capabilities exceed our abilities to comprehend them, that we cannot see beyond this point in time, this singular event, because the technology becomes so advanced, we cannot imagine it. It renders all of our current approaches to strategizing almost useless, because these are based on capabilities. We have to understand the capabilities of our adversaries in order to compete against them. Why do I talk about the singularity rather than all of the miscellaneous AI steps that we have on the route to the singularity? Well, one, as an academic, it's much easier to illustrate an extreme case. I don't have to qualify everything I say with, uh, with some other fact. And two, it's just more fun to talk about the singularity than it is to talk about Alexa. So if we're going to look at the singularity, though, we have a problem. Uh, the problem is that it is an event that we cannot see beyond. We don't have any data. We don't have any information. But we know it's probably coming. Uh, not necessarily exactly the date, though 100 years, 50 years is very reasonable. This is what I like to call the dark force deterrence theory dilemma. It draws on the works of Cezanne Liu, a Chinese science fiction author. Uh, in his novels, a protagonist must develop a theory neither based on nor testable by data. Uh, to prepare for something that is distant, but certain that it's something that is coming. Uh, in a book that was all about aliens and alternate dimensions, uh, I found as a scientist this the most fantastical, unbelievable part of the books, that we as scientists with no data could develop a theory to actually resolve a problem uh, that we were facing uh, seemed unrealistic. Nonetheless, this is the problem, the task that lies before us today. Because of this dilemma, though, in most security planning today, we see a lack of imagination, as the 9-11 Commission put it, actually. Uh, we see strategies that aren't so much strategies for an AI era, even if they have that title. They are strategies for the run-up, for before the AI era. They are strategies to win the AI race, not to actually use AI in a manner that obtains an objective. So these strategies tend to only focus on winning because the AI race is seen as a zero-sum game. You either win or you lose, and you might as well just you know, hang it up and become a farmer. Uh, nonetheless, though, strategy is actually at its most useful when you are weak. 
It's needed to counter weakness and, again, get more out of the situation than the balance of power suggests. Maybe I'm asking too much, though. Maybe this is a bridge too far. Uh, the singularity is, by definition, unknowable. Asking a planner today to sit down and say, hey, imagine using AI, asking Dr. Franca, in 50 years, what are we going to use AI for? would be like asking a general from the 1890s, an era of colonial and Indian wars, to both imagine and then put into operation the tools of World War II. So maybe we're asking too much. I say no, though, for two reasons. First, some people are already doing this. There are plenty of policy experts there, uh, respected in their own fields, who have begun offering their own insights and their opinions on what we should do about AI. Uh, since he's a big man and he can take it, I'll, I'll point out Henry Kissinger in this regard. Says that he knows nothing about AI. Nonetheless, he's written several articles on it, uh, labeled transhumanism as the most dangerous ideology that mankind is facing. Uh, he and others like him are making policy even as the AI experts or us security experts are sitting aside going, no, we can't do that, we don't have the data. Uh, but it's done, been done before. Within the military field, there are several scholars in the Air Force, an Italian scholar, and in the naval realm, an American scholar, who envisioned air power and naval power long before they became the dominant strategic tools of major countries. So we can do it, and indeed we must. However, we have a fear of futurology, especially as academics terrified of being called a futurologist. Uh, if you want to see a futurologist, there's one speaking uh, concurrently to me on the other stage. Very good. Follow him on Twitter. I recommend it. Because we shouldn't fear futurology because this fear is a danger to our own future. Because uh, the merit of study for any sort of thing we're going to look at isn't whether it's really easy to study. It's how important it is. So how do we study AI? Well, this is a throw out to my academic friends. You always have to have the slide that mentions the Janus face nature of something. So uh, the Janus face nature of the singularity is that it's at the intersection of religious belief and scientific knowledge. So this requires a very interdisciplinary perspective to understand. We need, we're going to need a lot of different people to get together on this issue. But before I dive into an approach, first we need to step back and cover one qualification. If this is partially based on belief, if we are the ones driving artificial intelligence, if a bunch of nerds believing in the singularity make it a self-fulfilling prophecy, then why don't we just avoid it? Why don't we just skip the whole process? Uh, other scholars have dealt in depth with this on the multiple paths there are to various forms of artificial intelligence. So there certainly is no fate except the one we make. Uh, nonetheless, artificial intelligence in some form or another, or singularity technologies in some form or another, do lie at the end of that path. Uh, and this path shouldn't be seen negatively. Uh, this path opens up opportunities for different technologies and for different countries to leverage their comparative advantages in different areas. I have my own views on the European AI landscape that's been oft discussed today. And I actually do see a little bit of hope if the European tech sector can survive the next 10, 10 20 years. Uh, we can go into that in the questions, though, perhaps. So, in other words, no, you can't stop it. You can't stop the signal. As people who even preceded uh, Ray Kurzweil making the singularity famous have said, the singularity will come because every move a country makes will simply encourage somebody else to follow another path to it. So how do we tackle the singularity? We need another way of thinking, and I'm going to rather... Um, <laughs> Ironically, take nuclear weapons as a sign of hope here. Uh, nuclear weapons signaled for many strategic thinkers the death of traditional strategy. You couldn't ever use a nuclear weapon to obtain a strategic objective. Rather, it became an exercise in utilizing uncertainties in a creative manner in order to develop a doctrine, a belief about how we can ensure these weapons are never actually utilized. It was control leading to inaction that ensured our survival, even while conflict in general continued to exist. So I take the non-use of nuclear weapons as a sign of hope. Countries that were previously, 10 years ago, non-use being very qualified with the two uses there were, uh, countries that were previously leveling cities and fighting a long war didn't use these weapons for decades. Now I'm going to segue into stuff that uh, my, uh, my uh, predecessor, Dr. Franco, would uh, find familiar. I'm going to try to take this a little bit from another way, though. 
I'm going to start from the broad and work down to how maybe you also as business leaders or more also as security professionals could take a security perspective and derive operable actions you can take today from a larger doctrine or belief to guide your thought. Very briefly, I'm going to talk about some of the ideas of Clausewitz because this is the way that we can just ground our thinking in something people understand. And because we're in Germany. So just to cover this, Clausewitz had two main concepts, one on the nature of war, one on the trinity. The nature of war was interactive, violent, and political. And the trinity was passion, reason, and chance. Talking about the first, I'm going to talk about how the nature of conflict and competition will change. My goal here is to encourage you to be more imaginative. The first point is on interaction. Do you know your enemy? Who are we competing against? This is going to change as we progress further and further towards an advanced artificial intelligence. Today, the one we see a lot is the AI race. Perhaps it's because we understand this the most well. We can utilize game theory. We can talk about competition and collective action problems, mechanisms of diffusion. And we can model this and understand it. Whether this is useful or not, whether it contributes to the problem, another question. But this is only the first interaction we're going to see. There are interactions at many other levels. Once somebody wins that race, you've got to deal with an AI-enabled adversary. You can't use capabilities to understand how this adversary is going to, be, to act or what they can possibly do, because we don't know those capabilities. Rather, you're going to have to develop mechanisms to understand how, on a psychological level, level or through a game theoretic level, an actor's behavior changes when their information changes and when their time horizons change. Nonetheless, these will still be humans, and we can still relatively understand how they will be thinking through an anthropomorphic lens, the same perceptions of time, death, space, and so on. However, there is a latent actor that we should probably already start thinking about. Uh, political scientists talk about this in their own game theoretic models, how there are latent actors, and our failure to account for them explains a lot of suboptimal outcomes we see today. Those actors are unborn generations that we currently can't model in our political dynamics and our political environments. We also have to now start thinking about the latent actor that is the artificial intelligence. This complicates any sort of game theoretic efforts, but it gets more complicated because it might turn out you actually have more in common with Alexa than you do have in common with a farmer from Wisconsin, which I make fun of only because I am originally a farmer from Wisconsin. So as illustrated in the books by Degaris on the Artelic Wars, uh, the real artificial intelligence conflict will probably be right down the middle of society. Bouncing around a little bit for the cameraman there. I should uh, stop doing that so much. So this area is not only less considered than some of the other interstate elements. It's also got a lot less institutional mechanisms to control it. So it's probably one of the more dangerous elements. What about violence? How will this change? Dr. Franca mentioned that it's getting faster. You know, that when we look at it, we see hyper wars, as Virilio called them. Uh, speed is important. But it's not just faster airplanes, hypersonic drones and such. It's also speed of thought, speed of production, and speed of outcomes. As everybody knows, as the hardware improves, the speed of thought, the speed of processing power is going to get much faster. We have to account for how this impacts time horizons, though. Everybody says the war will be fast. But when you have a long time horizon, actually, you can attrit forever. And the, the strategy might actually be attrition. Why would you fight a quick, for a quick outcome when you can just outlast your opponent? Speed of production will also be something that changes quite a bit, as additive manufacturing, 3D printing, means that as often as Windows updates on your computer today, you'll be updating your hardware in real time as well, possibly leading to the death of logistics that Dr. Frank again talked about. Outcomes will also become very fast. It may be that the perfect strategy, as Sun Tzu points out, is not actually to have any serious fighting at all. If the AIs become so fast, the drones fighting out in the upper atmosphere, then you may see no violence at all. You may just wake up tomorrow in a different country, 
Oh, we lost the war last night, didn't you hear? Well, you know, I didn't even know it happened. Uh, outcomes will be different. So how are we going to even understand the outcomes? Because that is the actual point of strategy, is to reach a certain outcome, the political end, as scholars in political science and strategic thought like to call it, victory. This is an important an element for scientific analysis. It's important for strategic analysis as well. It's important for artificial intelligence development, the target. But how do we know what this should be? This is probably the part where I'm the most fuzzy myself. Uh, traditionally, they always said it's a political purpose, but they only got away with this by defining politics as basically everything. And maybe we see the implications of that today in our uh, society where everything is political. Instead, we have to start thinking in another way. Maybe that outcomes are more existential. I'm not going to walk you through this thought exercise because I want to save some time for questions, and I'm going to walk you through a different thought exercise right after this anyhow. So you can read through my slides when undoubtedly Rise of AI provides them. Instead, let's close out with talking about the Trinity. Clausewitz's idea of the Trinity was passion, reason, and chance. These were embodied in certain political actors, but that's a, another issue. In my view, these ideas in the age of singularity security are best encapsulated in the concept of uncertainty. Chance, of course, equates very directly to uncertainty. Reason equating to the information that you utilize to reduce your uncertainty. And passion is about that decision you have to make between those two factors. Luckily, for dealing with uncertainty, this is what strategic theory is all about. How to take uncertainty and apply it to make yourself more secure. Traditionally, this always meant that we must reduce uncertainty. We must be more sure. However, when we're dealing with singularity technologies, my proposal is that we actually may not always seek to do that because we can't. We won't be able to reduce uncertainties. Instead, we have to look at creative ways of managing them, of paradoxical ways to, if not reduce our uncertainty, increase somebody else's uncertainty, not in a way that makes them uncomfortable, but in a way that possibly just gives them more options. But options then increase our probability of being able to work with those actors. So let me start this by proposing a starting axiom, a principle. Uh, this is uh, the lines of my own research, and there are many other ways we could take it, but uh, points for thought. Everything has limits. And an agent with limits thinks and acts in a different way. They take those limits into account in their behavior. These ways, then, if an actor has limits, can be manipulated if you understand what those limits are. And areas of pronounced limits can even be magnified against an area where an actor has no limits. Perhaps the best illustration of this in the scientific literature is the paradox of immortality, uh, that an actor who is immortal, who lives forever, has much higher costs in the short term because everything reverberates through, through centuries, through eons. Their own limitations in, I cannot do this, I can't think fast enough because I uh, is is reflected through the eons. So I propose that we need to actually look further at the limits imposed by physics. This is my own research, looks at ideas like how the speed of light affects time horizons, how theories like the principle of least action will inform the thinking of any actor. Yes, these limits are astronomical. The speed of light is terribly fast. There are a lot of atoms in the universe, yet they are limited. And there are other limits, limits imposed by quantum technology. Uh, if quantum encryption ever comes along, limits that will be imposed on what can be known and what can be kept secret. Limits at the atomic level of what can be seen and what cannot be seen. The current stealth technology is nothing compared to the next generation stealth, which will, will utilize quantum principles in a way that makes it unbreakable. Once we understand what these limits are, we can then utilize them to push an actor's behavior in our favor, whether that actor be an AI-enabled adversary of the human nature, or whether that actor be an independent AI. To take you through a little thought exercise on this, let me illustrate by a little story. For those of you who uh, are really into Star Trek canon, you'll forgive me if I get any details wrong. Uh, if we look at Star Trek IV, this was set sometime in the future, and a ship came to the Earth, and was sending a signal that was disrupting the entire atmosphere. It was looking pretty bad for the Earth. 
they figured out that this signal was trying to communicate with humpback whales. However, humpback whales had gone extinct 200 years prior. So to resolve the dilemma, the Enterprise had to go back in time and, and get some whales and bring them back to the future. Time travel's a, a high barrier, though, may not even be possible. Nonetheless, we can utilize the concept within this that if an artificial intelligence has a long enough time horizon and has enough options within that time horizon that its choices are maximized, it still will not have enough information to envision every possible future because it has lots of choices, because it has lots of times, there are lots of possible futures that it has to run a scenario analysis of. Uh, it can only think at the speed of light. Its unlimited time horizon is therefore magnified by the fact that it can only process at the speed of light, and by maximizing its choices, it just has too many things to analyze. In this way, this principle that we have, that there are limits, this idea, a doctrine, that we can utilize uncertainty. We can actually come down to a strategy, well, deterrence. We can deter them by giving them lots of choices. But the reason this becomes important today is you can actually derive design principles from it. That the long-term vision, the strategy that we have to control the singularity has actually designed decisions that need to be made today. For instance, many people argue, we need to program death by default. Uh, this is the design decision that led to all the problems in Blade Runner films. Based on my logic, however, the longer time horizon, the more we will be able to push the decisions of an artificial intelligence actor within directions favorable to our own survival. That by maximizing choice, by maximizing options, by embedding the principle of uncertainty within an artificial intelligence, which in my basic <laughs> artificial intelligence technical knowledge isn't that difficult because there's uh, most of the principles that we would be designing an AI based upon are heavily rooted in ideas of uncertainty, Bayesian statistics, chaos theory, or mathematical ways of modeling uncertainty. Uh, and by doing this, we can actually create an AI we could live with. But how do I know I'm right here? How do I know that I am the good man, that I have come up with a solution? Well. I can't really. This brings me back to my original point, that in order to come up with the paradoxical solutions required in the era of AI and a strategy to deal with and utilize those AIs, we need an interdisciplinary and creative team. We need as social scientists to learn to code. We need our AI people to go out and read us some philosophy. We all should sit down and watch Blade Runner once more. Um, and only by doing this can we uh, come up with these solutions that we need for you know, the next 50 and 100 years and the era of the singularity. With that, I'll kind of wrap it up. I've got some conclusions I can bring in, but we want to leave some time for questions or more comments. Uh, I'd love to hear people's opinions and, and feed in and get in touch with me if you like so that we can work together on this. Uh, my last job, I was working with a lot of sinologists and with uh, roboticists out of Munich. Uh, all these ideas are not born in a vacuum. And uh, next year in person, hope you can all come to Rise of AI here in Berlin. Uh, and we can uh, come up with ideas uh, over a coffee. Thanks. Uh, we we'll give it back to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I think if you go over there, we don't really have questions. We only have praise for you, which yeah. is amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I get it uh, from the students all the time. So no. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's meant to inspire thought, uh, not to inspire debate. I must say, I never trained an AI model, but what I uh, what I learned from at least my portfolio companies that what you described as the trinity from Clausewitz is very similar, mm -hmm. because at the end you need a lot of passion also to finish it. <laughs> but uh. before, at least there's something. Anyways, um, m maybe uh, is there any practical advice to people applying AI, like really in practice? Let's imagine a startup building a product with an AI model or actually scaling the startup, creating this superiority. Is there anything? you learn from your Python and research experience? Well, I've read from many artificial intelligence scholars, I think the camera up there, or you, who gets more attention? Hello, people. Uh, <laughs> I've read from many artificial intelligence scholars that giving AI a conception of time is incredibly important. It's an important next step forward. They do have some mechanisms for capturing components of time already, uh, LTSM, attention mechanisms and such. So I would start focusing on those 
Uh, and I believe a lot of people are, they're very popular right now, so I'm not too concerned it's not getting the attention it does. Uh, but being able to give your artificial intelligence a feeling for time and space uh, is very important. This is also why I believe that uh, the technology is looking more into the spatial elements of artificial intelligence, really important. Um, or if you're just uh, not really an AI person, but you're uh, investing in it, uh, Think about time and space when you're thinking about your investments. The very simple ideas about this are just uh, uh, for, you could see it in long uh, high frequency trading, even right now, how you position your hub where you're doing all the processing in the ideal location between two major trading centers so that the difference in time uh, due to the speed of light in the pipes uh, are microseconds, but you can make a trade in that amount of time to leverage the difference in prices in different locations at almost simultane simultaneity, but not quite. That my couple microseconds makes a difference. Um, or space-wise, um, you know, buy Greenland because it will be uh, cooler for you to cool your AIs up there. Right, and uh, just being very, very boring here maybe with my question, but we always discuss on boards the strategy of obtaining high qualitative data and then labeling it, and that gives me some kind of data advantage, superiority. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, a valid strategy that you've seen also in your research, where somebody can get the higher ground? I don't know. Or is that just a temporary effect and I should aim for more? Um, if, if this is going to be relatively opinionated, though I think Google is with me on this. I've read some stuff about them. Uh, so you're talking about label data, that which would be much more in the supervised learning direction. And that is apparently a, a dead-end path. Uh, Google likes to say they're focusing on semi-supervised learning. Uh, the real cutting-edge people want to do unsupervised or reinforcement learning. Uh, I know nothing about reinforcement learning. I'd love to because I'm, I'm into these kind of games and such, and that's usually what they uh, utilize for you know, Alpha Star and such. Uh, so my advice would be, no, maybe don't focus on label data. Uh, the problem is, and I was discussing this with one of our colleagues here today, uh, Europe, I think, has a huge advantage in this long-term technology. They've got the Human Brain Project, they've got great roboticists, they've got physics research in you know, CERN. They can lay the basis for really great singularity technologies. Uh, if they skip over the label data bit, and the supervised learning bit, problem is, payoffs are longer for that. Will the European industries and government initiatives be bought out by Facebook and Huawei in the next 10, 20 years because they're not making the profit immediately uh, and they'll get bought up and then we won't actually have the European AI sector that we uh, hope to develop. Right. And then uh, looking at Christmas, uh, what do you put on, under your Christmas tree as a wish from everybody that could help making AI more uh, more widespread. Uh, three three thousand series NVIDIA graphics card. So that I think every every AI researcher is kind of wishing for one of those under their Christmas tree right now. But uh, one PlayStation is enough. Okay, yeah, no, no, oh, I, I need at least two of them. <laughs> uh, but, okay. So um, yeah, generally speaking, that uh, more broadly speaking, I would love to just uh, see everybody crack open a book that is not something you would normally find on your shelf or um, do what I did, uh, take a coding boot camp over the summer because, you know, COVID, you can't do anything else anyways. Bars in Berlin are closed. Um, do something a little bit to expand your horizons, and I would hope that the governments as well would uh, do more to encourage that as well. Uh, create these AI spaces that some of our colleagues discussed this morning where people can get together and, and shoot for the big ideas instead of just always making some more, uh, more apps for your phone. That's a very nice finishing line. Thanks so much, Paul, for that. It's Thank Paul, you. right? Jesse. Jesse or Jesse Paul? Paul. Uh, Jesse you, Paul. You can, cool. you, I know. Jesse. I Thanks so much everything. for being here. I think that was a great finish of the evening. My pleasure. Yes. There we go. Thank you also to everybody else. And uh, I give that over to you. Thank you.